we look for five things, okay? First thing is, does the person have a really, really good product? Is this gonna like, you know, uh, change the industry or, or be a big savings or whatever? Second thing is, is the person coachable? You know, can we actually work with this person? The next one is, can the business either now or in the future ever run on its own on automatic pilot? Mm -hmm. And then the next thing is... Uh, no, without the owner is what you mean. Yeah, without the owner. Yeah. And then uh, the next thing is, uh, you know, is it scalable? In other words, are, is there a widget that works and then you can build millions of widgets? See? And then the last thing is, uh, does the owner... Uh, want to monetize their brand equity, either through a sale or a merger. Mm -hmm. they, in two years or 20 years, it doesn't matter. A lot of people say, I'm never going to sell my business, you know. I feel sorry for those people because they sell at a loss when they yeah. do sell. <laughs> exactly. The, the, the two highest hidden costs of business is lack of engagement and turnover. Mm -hmm. And if you can, they're hidden, costs. they're hidden costs. They're very expensive. When you lose somebody, you lose all their relationships. You lose all their training. You lose all the money to replace them. You lose all the money that it costs you to keep other people employed that now have to work at half speed to train them. And then maybe they don't work and you start over. So, I mean, we had no turnover during the last five years of our company. Wow. Wow. So company culture is a big thing that we talk about. That's oh, yeah. a major subject that we talk about and we educate. Yeah, you and want, that's what this business audio theater is all about. It's, it's company a, culture. Exactly. And I, I was just going to say, you know, when the cement is wet, you can move it with a trowel. When the cement gets hard, you need a jackhammer. And so the cement is wet when the employee is hired on their first day. Imagine handing them an MP3 formatted audio book, which is basically the history of your, your company with all the challenges and, and outcomes and everything else to help them appreciate what the founders went through to create that job they have. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, you answer first, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> well, my dinner table was uh, a very dominant, you know, uh, Irish Catholic uh, Republican father uh, who, was, who was not short on physical punishment. And then on the other side of the table was a mother who was very bright and uh, very active in the community uh, and uh, they they would tend to argue across the table, and then the four kids would be there, you know, and I would sit there with my other two brothers and my sister, and, um, you know, we had to be careful that we weren't the subject of whatever the problem was, mm -hmm. so it was, it was kind of like, see how fast you can finish dinner and get out, out of there, uh, but it was, uh, you know, it, it, it was... It was a classic 1950s household, you know, Archie Bunker-esque. Mm -hmm. So, Bonnie, how was yours? <laughs> well, um, we enjoyed a family dinner most every night together at a table, which consisted of my mother, my two younger brothers, my sister and her husband, and their four kids. So it was like a big family. I generally uh, either helped with the cooking or did it myself. My mother was busy doing other things. At least it seemed like I was cooking for a huge family all the time. The food mostly came out of my mother's garden. Oh, wow. So it was always fresh, organic food. And we didn't have to eat everything on our plate, but we put the food on our plate. If you put it on your plate, then you should eat it mm -hmm. is the idea. And if you hadn't tried something before, then you should just give it a little taste. Don't just say, I don't know what it is and I won't eat it. So we were allowed to make a lot of the decisions about food ourselves. We were never uh, rewarded or punished using food. So it was just a great time for the family to get together and, um, you know, enjoy some good organic foods. <laughs> I love it. I love it. What, what was the favorite thing that, uh, that you guys grew? Oh, gosh. My mother had a garden half the size of a football field. <laughs> there wasn't anything that she didn't grow, Matt. Wow. She grew for herself and my sister's family and all the neighbors and anybody else that would drop their kids by. They knew they were always going to get a meal at my, my house, at my mom's house. Yeah. Yeah. 
she fed a lot of kids, I'll tell you. That's great. That's great. <laughs> So, so did either one of you have any entrepreneurial tendencies as you were growing up? Uh, you know, were you the ones that had, you know, you both, you both are always raising their hands right now. So um, <laughs> what, what, types, what types of jobs or, or things were you guys doing at a, at a young age? I started babysitting because everybody was younger than me when I was about seven. Mm -hmm. So I was very responsible and I took babysitting babysitting jobs all over. I, uh, I actually watched a, a one and a half year old and a newborn for a weekend when I was about 10 wow. by myself. So I could do all that. I also came up with all the party ideas, decorating ideas, gathering up the family and neighbors and, and, you know, creating bouquets on May Day and doing fundraisers for somebody who'd lost their home. And, um, Anything that was going on, I was the organizer for. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's fantastic. And I, I, had, uh, uh, I had a newspaper route. Um, and, uh, you know, it was one of those, uh, you wear a bag over your shoulders. Mm -hmm. And in the front was a big pouch. And in the back was a big pouch. And you always had to make sure they were balanced or you'd tip over. <laughs> and uh, God help you if it rained, because those newspapers <laughs> would just soak up the rain. Um, and uh, I saved up enough money to get a bike, and then I put the bag on the bike and delivered newspapers that way. Um, and that was my first job. And then my second job was courtesy clerk for a large supermarket chain where I would help people out with their groceries. And then I graduated to bottle boy. And in those uh -huh. days, they took, they took recycling seriously. Uh, people paid a lot of money to get, you know, a pop bottle to get the mm -hmm. glass, mm -hmm. so much money that they would feel obligated to bring it back. Well, well, they bring it back and it would have to go back in the right six pack and it'd have to go in, in the right cartons uh, and crates and pallets. So it had to be organized. So with this room, they would just throw the glass in, then they put the bottle boy in there. And then at the end of the day, everything would be organized. Wow, wow. So that, that was, my, that was my, one of my first jobs. Wow. <laughs> well, my, my first real job was with Arthur Murray Dance Studio. Very I cool. had, uh, yeah, I was on the phone. I'd call people and say, well, you do enjoy dancing, don't you? <laughs> selling selling at a young age. <laughs> Same as I never learned to dance. I never took the lessons myself. <laughs> that, that's, that's funny. That's funny. So, so all of that sort of gave you your foundations for, um, creating what you guys created, which is, I mean, absolutely amazing. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the, what the inspiration was or, or how you guys got involved in Barefoot Wines? The inspiration was an opportunity that presented us, itself to us. It was not following a passion, but it was following an opportunity passionately. And that opportunity was $300,000 that was owed to my client for his grapes that he wasn't getting paid for. Okay. Um, I sent Michael out to collect the funds and he got to the winery and what do you know? They had just declared bankruptcy that morning. Wow. So there was no funds to collect. Um, but Michael was able to do a trade and he traded bottling services and bulk wine for that $300,000. Now, our client couldn't take over the business. He had a full-time job as a winemaker, plus he was managing his vineyard. Okay. So there's the opportunity, $300,000. Do we just let it go away? Or do we jump in there in an industry that we know nothing about <laughs> with no money and just say, hey, how hard could it be? Yeah, yeah. How long could it take? So. Um, ignorance is bliss, and that's how we got into the wine industry. So we basically took over the debt. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So and you made the bottling services and yeah. wine, and yeah. went yeah. out to sell the product. Yeah. So, so you guys, you guys basically uh, took on essentially you took on the the mortgage uh, that was that was owed on it. You know, you took over the responsibility for that debt. Then. That's um, right. He was faced with three cents on the dollar, or maybe Michael and Bonnie would do better. Wow, wow, that's fantastic. Now, now the brand um, Barefoot, uh, how did you guys come up with that? Is there a story behind that? 
Well, oh, huge story. <laughs> well, I guess if I can start out. You may. Yes. Thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, when you don't know what you're doing and you're broke, you're very humble and you tend to ask a lot of questions. And because you're not from the in industry, you don't ask industry people. That turned out to be a big strength of ours. Mm -hmm. uh, so we would ask people who are like forklift operators or warehouse managers or store Dark buyers clerks. or clerks. You know, the people that had dirt under their fingernails, we'd say, we made friends with people in low places. Well, those people turned out to give us insights that we would have never gotten from the white collar workers. Mm -hmm. And because they're out there doing the work. Yeah. And they told us, they said things like, you know, well, the label, uh, you know, on the label, the, the image, the logo has to be the same as the name. And it has uh -huh. to be plain English and it has to be visible from four feet away so she can see it when she's pushing her cart. Wow. And you know, so, so, I mean, this was like, at the time we thought, oh, okay, these people are telling us what works that they know of and what doesn't work that they know of. Yeah. But what do they know of? They know of the entire industry because yeah. they're handling, they're handling the products, they're moving them around, they're, they're seeing what moves on the shelf and what doesn't. So we just, we just did that. And so, um, we were looking for, you know, a, a logo that had the name the same as the, as the uh, image. And no, the name the same as the image. The name the was the same as the image, and it was in plain English. And uh, we had a friend, or I had a friend that I kind of grew up with. His dad had a product called Barefoot Bynum that he kind of did as a novelty uh, sold, I guess, about 7,000 cases in over a period of you know, maybe 10 years. And then it dropped it off the market for 12 years. And so we said, well, you know, that that's a pretty good uh, solution. The name mm -hmm. Barefoot is the same as the image of Barefoot, mm -hmm. right? So And grapes used to be crushed barefoot to make wine. So that's how we related ah, it. Yeah. And, then, and it was easy to pronounce. No French. Those were all things that were important. Yeah. And, and it was recreational, you know, like when you're barefoot, it's hard to be uptight. So we got the label, but Bonnie didn't like the label, right? Oh, well, we weren't going to use his label because it just had a foot that was horizontal at the bottom uh, okay. of the label. It didn't have any life to it. You could put just a put a tag on the toe and send it back, back to the north. <laughs> yeah. So I said, let's lift it up and put it at a 45 degree angle. So it looks like it's stepping up. Yeah. So it looks yeah. like an italicized exclamation point and then put the word barefoot into the high arch. So that's how we designed it. There's wow. a great scene from our theatrical audio book that on what Bonnie just described. It takes place after midnight one night when we're out at friend's house and uh, you know, we come home and she goes, I've got it. I know exactly what the label looks like. And I said, well, can't it wait till morning? She says, look at the clock, it's already morning. Let's get to work. <laughs> uh, that's so, great. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then she sent the picture of the foot that I drew on the chalkboard to the artist in Hollywood. And she kept coming back with these feet that weren't exactly the way Bonnie wanted it. And so the artist says, look, I can draw any kind of foot you want. Just give me a picture. And so Bonnie says, what? Yeah, I said, well, where am I going to find a long, thin foot with a high arch? I said, well, you know, I've got one of those right here on the end of my leg. Yeah. <laughs> so I sent Michael out to get the biggest ink pad he could find. I put my foot in it and put it on some artist paper and sent wow. that off. That's how my foot ended up on the largest wine brand in the world. <laughs> That's incredible. That's fantastic. I love that story. <laughs> you've got to use any assets you've got, right? Even exactly. Even body parts. Hey, we were broke. <laughs> that is fantastic. So, so what happened next? How did you, how did you launch uh, that, that brand? How did you uh, bring that to market? Well, plan A was we bottle it all up and sell it to the supermarket buyer. Mm -hmm. the biggest buyer in California. He's the one that gave us the advice on what the label should look like. Sure. Unfortunately, Michael went in there and he didn't get the reception he was hoping <laughs> for after we bottled. No, it's, there's, there's a great scene in the, in the theatrical version of the, the audio book. Uh, so the Michael character comes in uh, to, the, to the buyer's office and the buyer who, who is played by uh, 
Ed Asner says, yeah, Houlihan, what do you want? Sit down, spill and get out of here. You know, I don't have time for you type thing. And he says, look, you know, I did everything you asked for. You know, the name is the same as a label. You know, it's in 1.5 liter, uh, liter uh, package. Uh, it's a red and a white. It's all these things. You know, how many truckloads do you want? Because that was plan A, right? We were just going to mm -hmm. sell it to a supermarket down the road, right? He says, I can't buy this. He says, are you crazy? He says, you put a foot on it. He says, that's radical. And nobody's ever heard of anybody, anything called barefoot. There's no box store, no chain store in the country is going to carry this brand, you know, unless you put $2 million in the advertising. Are you going to put $2 million in? And I said, no, I only have, I don't think I have $1,000 to my name. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he says, well, you know, I don't know what. I said, well, I bottled it out for you. He says, yeah, so what am I going to do? He says, well, I guess you got to sell it to every mama, papa, and every little independent store Wow! before, you know, I'll take it because it has to be a household word. And I said, well, that's going to take years. And he said, that's right. You better get started. Wow. Now get out of my office. See? Wow. So, so Michael went out in the marketplace starting in San Francisco and visited with our sales rep through a distributor all the little markets and they said the same thing. Nobody's ever heard of this. And what, what is this goofy foot on the label? Mm -hmm. And um, so they said, well, okay, some of them, most of them said no. Some of them said, well, I'll take a couple cases and if they sell fine, I'll order some more. And if they don't, then you know, you're out of here. So that was a huge challenge. Now we realized that it was up to us to get customers in there. Mm -hmm. So who are the customers that are going to go in to buy? So we had to sell the distributor. We had to sell the salesperson. Uh -huh. We had to sell the retailer. Oh, what do you know? We had to go out and get customers to buy the product at retail. Mm -hmm. And of course, so, this is this is all before, way before you know Facebook, which is where everybody would yes. you know turn to today to to do advertising. So how how did yeah, you? We didn't we didn't have any followers. We didn't have any members. Yeah. You know, we had a few friends, but how many bottles can they buy and drink? I don't know. <laughs> but, yeah. but something did happen. There, 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 was, there was a watershed moment. Uh, we got a call from a guy uh, in San Francisco who represented a neighborhood uh, fundraising group, and they wanted to raise money for a kids after school park. And so he mistakenly went through the phone book or whatever and he saw a barefoot wine so he calls us up and he says i only need fifty thousand dollars you know for swings and slides and sandboxes you know can you can you give me some money and we said look man you, you sure you have the right number we, you, we don't have any money Are you, kidding? you know we're, we're completely broke uh i said but you know we do have wine i'll tell you what we'll give you some wine uh, you can use it at your fundraiser. Maybe it'll loosen some people up and they'll write a bigger check or you could auction it off and maybe, you know, buy some swings and slides with the money. Mm -hmm. And he goes, okay. You know, he really was kind of disappointed. He took the wine. We didn't hear from him again, but that month sales took off in his neighborhood. Really? And we said, oh, that's really interesting. I wonder if it would work in another neighborhood. Yeah. So we went to another neighborhood and they were trying to clean up a creek and so we donated wine to their fundraiser to clean up the creek. Same thing happens in that neighborhood. And so then we began to realize that we had discovered a way of getting the word out that wasn't a $2 million expense where we could actually help out communities. We called it Worthy Cause Marketing and work with networks that were already established Mm -hmm. See, to and and give and give their membership a social reason to buy our product rather than a mercantile reason. So yes, it was good wine, big deal. There's lots of good wine out there. Why did they buy ours? Because we were supporting their group. So that's how Barefoot really gets started. I love that. I love that. And then obviously, you guys, I, it, th this took a, a while. How long did it take to get from you know this first? those first few, uh, uh, I guess, programs that you identified to, you know, where you actually started to scale and, and uh, mm -hmm. realized that you really had something here? A couple of years. Yeah, yeah, it was a couple of years. We had some false starts. We tried to spread ourselves too thin, like California, Oregon, Washington to start with. Mm -hmm. And we realized that we simply didn't have the time or energy to manage all those territories when we were such a small company. 
and um, we had to hire people that they would be what we called wine cops. They'd make sure that everything was being done right at the distributorship, that they didn't run out of product, that they delivered the right product to the retailers, and that uh, it, they would help get the product from the back room at the retailers out onto the shelf, make sure we didn't run out and check the prices and so many things that anybody who's got a product on the shelf knows has to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. And if you don't take care of it yourself, it's not going to get taken care of. So that was one of the biggest first lessons that we learned is we had to have somebody on our payroll managing the distribution system in every area where we had the product. Mm -hmm. But once we started getting the ball rolling, we used worthy cause marketing, community fundraisers, to quote unquote advertise our product throughout the nation. Mm -hmm. And our salespeople, our wine cops, would choose in each territory uh, what fundraisers that they wanted to support. And so we grew our product to one of the fastest growing wine brands in the nation without paid advertising. Wow. That is yeah, that was really a remarkable feat. And being able to be in a position to help all those nonprofits, I think that's really what we were most proud of. And it also made our staff proud. So they were all working together as a team. Mm -hmm. So I'd just like to add that uh, Bonnie and I are today, we're advisors to companies that are trying to market a product, you know, mm -hmm. a, a consumer packaged goods product, also CPG, they call it. And... Um, we we did not want to admit that people that we thought that had a financial interest in moving our product along. Like the distributor and like the, the retailer. retailer. We yeah. thought that for sure they would be trying to sell it. We never dreamed that we would have to do their job. Mm -hmm. See, and, and because we didn't, we didn't have any money set aside for the people that were required to do that kind of work. So basically what it boils down to is Barefoot winds up being successful because it focuses on merchandising. We just bypass the entire system and do all the work ourselves. And we do that for about five years. And finally, the system goes, oh, look at this. You know, because everybody wants to milk the cow. Nobody wants to raise the calf. Yeah, yeah. And, you know. So our sales were increasing at distributorships due to our salesperson making the sales at retail and bringing in the customers. Finally, after years, the distributors' salespeople would start recognizing, oh, this product moves. Maybe I should pay a little more attention to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love it. I love it. That, that is, uh, that is a, a really, really, really unique story on how uh, this all came to be. So you, you, you grew the brand that way. And then uh, you actually sold the, the brand uh, at some yes, point. Can you, can you talk about how you, how you put it up for sale, quote unquote, put it up for sale? Um, okay. Well, okay. So a big, that is a really interesting question for anybody yeah. that's building a product. So like, so like, you know, we operated under the same misconceptions that the general public has about business and sales. And it's because we live in a first world country where everything is there. You go into the store, everything is there, right? So you get the idea that it's somehow magical. You know, you say, well, why doesn't anybody think of this? Well, they thought of it. They just couldn't get it through the distribution system. And it's rotting in a, a warehouse in Kansas right now. Mm -hmm. so, so how do you actually sell the business itself? Well, first thing you have to do is you have to decide when you start your business why you are going into business. Are you going into business because it's a passion of yours and you want to be busy well, that's like throwing pizza. As long as you're throwing pizza, you're happy. But if you're not throwing pizza, you're not making any money. Mm -hmm. Now, or you say, I'm going to give it to my kid. Well, then what you're saying is your kid had better like throwing pizza, right? Mm -hmm. And if they don't, they're going to sell the business, you know, at a depressed price. Um, or the third reason is, is you say, I'm going to build a pizzeria chain mm -hmm. and I'm going to sell the chain to Domino's or to one of the big boys, right? So what we did is after, you know, when we got into business, our whole idea was to build a brand for the purpose of selling it. 
the, the, the college boy way to say that is monetizing your brand equity, mm-hmm. okay, through a, through a uh, capital event, right? The capital event is you get paid. So the question is, how do you attract your acquirer? See, now the misconception is the acquirer comes knocking at your door. It's a misconception. You go to your acquirer. you got to get your peanut in front of that elephant. So now you're talking about strategy. Now you're saying, how do I actually go about getting the attention? Well, first thing is, who are the elephants? There's only five in every industry. There might be six in some, but there's only three or two in others because we're living in the days of consolidation. And so when you take a look at it, you already know pretty much it's going to be one of the big five is going to buy your business. Mm -hmm. So then the question is, how do you get, how, how do you get to a point where they take notice? So what we suggest our clients do is that they take a broker to lunch and say, did you sell a business just like mine last year? How much did it sell for? What was its market share? Uh, what can you tell me about the business? You know, how many employees, how many states, you know, how many chain stores was it in? What was its volume? Until you get 18 or 20 questions down and guess what? That's your goals. You don't have the luxury of setting goals that are different than what your acquirer has to see before you become an acquisition target. And so now you are working toward achieving for our, in our case, for instance, a 599 bottle of wine, 500,000 cases a year before yeah. they would even look at you. Wow. wow. There's no profit there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there's no, so the idea is, you know, and here we were thinking, why won't anybody buy our business when we were 200,000? We thought, well, 200,000 is a big number. Well, no, yeah. not at the price point. So, Anyway, so that kind of addresses the issue of, you know, how do you sell your business? The other thing, too, is, you, you know, a lot of misconception about, oh, you offer it for sale and then the highest bidder. Okay, that's not true. If you offer it for sale, your sales manager leaves, your buyers say, you know, I bought from you, but now I heard that you're for sale. Mm-hmm. So I'm demanding that you sell it to me for $5 less a case because I know you're for sale. And what you're really selling is my uh, potential of buying from you. That's what your, your acquirer wants. He wants to buy my purchases of your product. So I've got you over a barrel now. Or, you know, what's worse is they say, I'm not going to buy anymore. I want to see what the new buyer does in terms of quality and price. I don't want to get stuck with something that is, you know, that you've sold. So so these are kind of like unmasking and demystifying some of the popular misconceptions about selling a business. And um, what you want to do is prepare for acquisition on day one, right? Um, Bonnie, what we did you talk a, about? We have a whole course that we give on this. And there's a number of things, starting off with, like Michael said, take a broker to lunch, have all your questions in order. But another very important thing is to make sure that all your records are in order. And we say from day one, because you really want to get your head wrapped around your goal, which is to sell your company. So it's important to have all that information in your brain when you're making your daily decisions. And when you decide to have this particular artist do your logo, let's make sure that you get a sign off from that Mm -hmm. person. Because if you wait 20 years, that's how long it took Michael and me uh, to sell our, our business. Then maybe if we hadn't have had that sign off on day one, she wouldn't have wanted just the 1500. She yeah. would have wanted 15,000 or add another zero or two on there. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> so these things are important and you certainly don't want your buyer to be interested or even have a couple buyers that may be interested. If you don't have your records together, you've got to do your due diligence for your buyer ahead of time. So you can present them with packages for different departments, the accounting, sales, personnel management, legal, all of these have their own packages uh, that is information about your company that you've been accumulating over the years. And when they say, see that you're ready to buy, they know so, that if they don't, excuse me, to sell, they know if they don't buy, their competition will. Mm-hmm. Yep, so yep. you don't have to threaten anybody. You can say, we are giving you the first right of refusal. And that's your number one potential buyer. And 
you don't have to say, but there's somebody else. They already know. Mm -hmm. So you put your peanut, your product, in front of the elephant, which is Mr. Big, whom you assume would be interested in your product. We did that by putting our product in the same distributors as our acquirer. So the distributorship themselves would be talking mm -hmm. to our potential acquirer uh, about our sales and how popular we were and what we were doing. And that way they'd have to pay attention. They're hearing it from somebody else, not from us. Yeah. And we never went to our acquirer. We had a broker go to our acquirer. Much better to have uh, your broker in between you and the buyer. So as you see, you've hit a nerve here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's lots and lots to know we, about that. We could that. talk for years. That this is, what's interesting is during the acquisition process, you can lose years worth of equity by mm -hmm. just making the wrong decision, the wrong statement, uh, you know, or being unprepared. What are you going to say? Hey, oh, I've got a legal sign off for that logo around here somewhere. I'm going to go, I'm going to go look for it. Why don't you guys remain really interested in buying yeah. my business while I look for it? And I'll get back to you within 30 days. And, and by the way, keep, don't, you know, don't say anything because we don't want to destroy <laughs> the value of this business in the marketplace. All right. And we can't tell our own people because they'll quit, but you know, stay interested. That's, that, that's such fantastic advice. I mean, you guys really had this buttoned up and well thought through, you know, Pretty well. It seems like the, the, the first uh, go through with all of this, again, you had all your ducks in a row. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you, you touched on it a few minutes ago, how you have a consulting business today. Um, can you talk a little bit about the types of companies that, that typically you would work with um, and what types of consulting you, you excel at? Uh, the lessons that we learned in building the Barefoot Wine brand pertain to any CPG, consumer product goods, any item that's on the shelf. So those are the companies that we prefer to work with, are companies that have a product that they're trying to get out there to retail. Or they are companies that are on the periphery that are doing like software or um, inventory management or sales management solutions uh, using, you know, big data and little data. Um, what we do is we're we are like their board of advisors. We meet with them once a week. They tell us just about what they're going to jump off of. And mm -hmm. we tell them whether there's a cushion or spikes down there, <laughs> you know, and um, we encourage them to make the right choices and we give them insights that they may not have thought about, you know, 30 years in business, you definitely have taken some phaser fire. So you know how to get through the Klingons, right? And it's, it's important to have somebody who has real world experience on your team. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we blow apart popularly held misconceptions. Yes. Almost all our clients suffer from the same misconceptions that we had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, for instance, oh, I sold to a big chain store. I'm going to put my feet up on the desk and smoke a big scar because I'm successful now. Yeah. And we say, oh, no, this is the worst time in your life because if you don't sell big at every outlet where that chain store is, they're going to discontinue and you'll mm -hmm. never be there again. Mm -hmm. So you better get out there with all your sales team, all your friends and family, and make sure you've got sales and manage every part of their operation. And um, you've got it. to take control. So <laughs> we, we've had, uh, you know, we have clients that come to us, they hear us speak or they hear us on podcasts mm -hmm. and they'll call us up. Our phone number is right on our website. Uh, and they will ask if, you know, if we could work together and we look for five things in a client. So we, we actually invest in our clients, but not with money, with something much more important, our time. And uh, our, our, our deal basically says we want a flat rate per month for the one hour a week, but we want a percentage of what you get paid for your business if and when it sells. So now they know that we're in it for the long run because we really, we wouldn't even charge them in the front end. It's just that people won't do what yeah. you suggest if it's free. Yep. It has no value. People will say, oh, no, I would do it. I would respect it. No. If you pay 2000 bucks for four hours a month, I guarantee you you're going to do what they tell you. 
Mm -hmm. so, I completely that's, agree. so that's, yeah, that's what we do. We, we, we look for five things. Okay. First thing is, does the person have a really, really good product? Is this going to like, you know, uh, change the industry or, or be a big savings or whatever. Second thing is, is the person coachable? Mm -hmm. You know, can we actually work with this person? The next one is, can the business either now or in the future ever run on its own on automatic pilot? Mm -hmm. And then the next thing is, uh, no, without the owner is what you mean. Yeah. Without the owner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, the next thing is, uh, you know, is it scalable? In other words, are, is there a widget that works and then you can build millions of widgets? See, and then the last thing is, uh, does the owner uh, want to monetize their brand equity, either through a sale or a merger? Mm -hmm. they, in two years or 20 years, it doesn't matter. A lot of people say, I'm never gonna sell my business, you know? I feel sorry for those people because they sell at a loss when they yeah. do so. <laughs> exactly. So, so you've mentioned a, a few times as well, kind of your, your new project, I guess you can say, is the, uh, the theatrical audiobooks. Um, talk a little bit about what you saw in the market and, and why you approached it in the way that you're approaching it. Uh, first of all, we wrote a book about our own experience. It's called um, The Barefoot Spirit, How Hardship, Hustle, and Heart Built America's Number One Wine Brand. And it became a New York Times bestseller because we had an excellent uh, author that we gave our stories to, and he put them all in story form. So it's really fun. So you get entertained and educated at the same time. So um, that was so popular uh, that we wanted to put it in the form of an audio book because that is the way more listeners are picking up on this kind of information is through audio. Mm -hmm. So we, in order to reach the greatest number of people, because we really are educators and we don't want other young businesses to suffer <laughs> the way we did. Yeah, yeah please. Ay, so many lessons to learn. So in order to get the message out, we put it in an audio book and we have a fully casted uh, crew that voiced all the characters, 103 characters in our book wow. through dialogue. And we also added sound effects and original musical score. And it took, it was one of the top five audio books in the business section. We received an audio award for being in the top five finalists. Yeah. That, wow. And then we said, this is such a wonderful way for people to hear the story of the founder, mm -hmm. to keep the founder's spirit alive. So the founder can tell his or her history and principles and goals and challenges and, and all the problems that they go through so their staff can understand fully. And that makes the staff more engaged and it makes them more willing to come up with good ideas, to be innovative, to realize that they're part of a team and not isolated in this one box that maybe is called accounting, for instance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we are offering that now to founders of businesses so they can use it as an onboarding tool. We call it business audio theater. We can take a founder's story and history and put it into an engaging story form and produce it for them that they can give to their people when they start so the people can have the real feeling and essence of how the company was built and what their goals were and are from the beginning. And um, there'll be much less turnover when people are engaged this way. Yeah, the, 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 the two highest hidden costs of business is lack of engagement and turnover. Mm -hmm. And if you can, they're hidden, costs. they're hidden costs. They're very expensive. When you lose somebody, you lose all their relationships. You lose all their training. You lose all the money to replace them. You lose all the money that it costs you to keep other people employed that now have to work at half speed to train them. And then maybe they don't work and you start over. So, I mean, we had no turnover during the last five years of our company. Wow. Wow. So company culture is a big thing that we talk about. That's oh, yeah. a major subject that we talk about and we educate. Yeah, you and want... that's what this business audio theater is all about. It's, it's company a... culture. Exactly. And I, I was just going to say, you know, when the cement is wet, you can move it with a trowel. When the cement gets hard, you need a jackhammer. 
And so the cement is wet when the employee is hired on their first day. Imagine handing them an MP3 formatted audio book, which is basically the history of your, your company with all the challenges and, and outcomes and everything else to help them appreciate what the founders went through to create that job they have. Mm -hmm. Well, now, you know, the cement is wet and they go, oh, I see why they're paying me $100,000 a year. Oh, I see how they made decisions. So now when they're faced with decisions, they go, I know how the founders would handle this because I remember that scene, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, where they did it this way and it worked and they did it this way and it didn't work. And so by actually you know, acting out uh, action and outcome for people to witness, it's easier for them to remember, recall, and apply. Yeah, much more immersive. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. So yeah. If, if people wanted to get in touch with you for any of your, your products, what would you say is the best way to, to reach out? Well, they can go to our website, which is uh, just like our book, The Barefoot Spirit, just like our audiobook. It's www thebarefootspirit.com. And I would also say uh, that we are going to give every one of your listeners a free chapter in our new audio book. It's 25 minutes long. I'm sure they'll get a big kick out of it. They'll hear sound effects, music, lightning going off, doors slamming, all that stuff. And, and you will walk away and go, wow, you know, this is a business adventure. And, and that's what it is. A business adventure stories is, is what we call it. I love it. I love it. Bonnie, Michael, thank you for sharing your story today. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that we're going to be hearing many more things from you guys. You, you are uh, incredible, incredible people. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Matt. This has been so much fun. Yeah, it's been a blast. Excellent. Thanks, guys.